I'd like to welcome everyone today tonight and uh, with particular thank to Manide and the events team, Tom and the AA Bookshop for really setting this event up. And tonight we're launching our new book, Architects After Architecture, Alternative Pathways for Practice. And I have to say the AA felt like really the best place to present this project, given that so many of our brilliant contributors have either studied here or thought here have different points of their career. And, and this is no coincidence, we believe, and certainly a testament to the ethics of the school. And I'm one of those people, after studying at the AA, I've been teaching history and theories for the best part of the last decade. Um, and then I worked on this book alongside my uh, brilliant co-editors, Harriet Harris, who's the Dean of Architecture at Pratt, and she's connected from New York today, and Rory Hyde, who is formerly Curator of Architecture at the v &A, and now just relocated to Melbourne and is at the University of Melbourne. Um, so in terms of the format, we're just going to, each of us is going to say a few words about the book, touching on uh, the genesis of the project, the structure and the key takeaways. And then we would very much like to open up the discussion to you guys and particularly because there are um, quite a few of friendly faces as Rory was pointing out and of contributors who are connected and we very much like their input. Um, okay, so the, the story of the book um, so it was back in 2019, I think, and the RBA originally approached us to compile a sort of manual for part two architectural students, something like a book covering anything from procurement to how to build your clients or tracking working hours, etc. And as we set out to do this work, and producing this sort of snapshot of, of contemporary practice, we kind of realized that there was another story which maybe could have been worth telling. And yet we came across these stats which were saying that the number of architects who either leave architecture or redefine what they do is surprisingly high. Um, in the RBA educational statistics, for instance, show that over half of the students who have completed the undergraduate bachelor of architectural degree, which we know as part one, do not go on to complete the postgraduate path three, which is a requirement for registration as an architect. So basically this means that there is a gap of around 1600 students per year. And we thought that rather than sweeping this cohort under a carpet and pretending that they don't exist or letting them find their own way, we could try to map what these people end up doing. And, and we started wondering, like, you know, what if this, what if we started to acknowledge these diverse pathways as a sign of success rather than failure on a sort of way of abandoning the profession? So what if we start talking about them as a sign of a broader applicability of architectural thinking beyond just the mere act of making buildings and beyond a notion of the profession which is quite rigid and which says that you know, after graduation, one is supposed to enter private practice, perhaps in a urban center and work on buildings which are commissioned by those who can afford it. And, and you know, it's like the, the final provocation for us was, what if architecture could be promoted as a generalistic, as a generalist degree, as a way of thinking about broader societal issues, about the world, about uh, systemic crisis, rather than maybe a step forward towards professional accreditation. Now, this provocation didn't necessarily go down too well with the RBA, and we realized that the definition of architecture and the one that we were trying to propose here didn't necessarily coincide. And so we, we were motivated to find a different publisher, which in this case is Routledge. And, you know, you have to think this was well before COVID. So I think since the pandemic hit, 
um, like a lot of the crises which were already underway were exacerbate, exacerbated. And, and this in some way, this condition like made us even more convinced that this project was really worth pursuing. And, and indeed, I would say this book is very much dedicated to my cousins, Michael Sorkin, Bill Melkin, Lou Goodman, Victoria Gregotti, and all those great architectural thinkers who have tragically lost their lives in the past year. And we really do feel that it is important, this book is very important at this moment of crisis, when many of us have lost their mentors, or maybe are out of work, or maybe are still students and they are worried about a future that seems ever more uncertain. And so perhaps um, they're looking for new paths forwards and they can find some ideas in this book. So on that not, note, I'm gonna um, like leave it to Rory to tell you a bit more about the structure of the book and the content. Thanks, Roberta. Um, good evening, everyone from Melbourne. Um, we set out to answer a really simple question, which is what can you do with a degree in architecture? Um, we present 40 answers to that question, all very different. Um, invited texts, interviews uh, with practitioners and a number of case studies. Um, and with uh, the team at Studio Folder, graphic designers, um, brilliant graphic designers, we created this kind of diagram which tries to understand or locate where those answers came from, where those practices sit. So in the centre here you can see architecture as it's perhaps um, more traditionally conceived, the uh, private practice, the um, boutique practice, um, and then we have these two clouds on either side. One of them we've, we've described as plus which is really people who still imagine themselves as, as being architects, as part of architecture, but who have extended what they do in particular directions. And we've got some of those keywords there towards climate change, towards um, inclusion in its broadest sense, towards working with communities, towards um, different forms of making, towards redefining practice and culture. And then on the other side of the diagram in the white, we see the territory of beyond, which is people who have come from architecture, they've studied it, they may have um, begun practice, but who have then at some point uh, in a way left or jumped out. And, may, and many of them describe their relationship to architecture in different ways. But these are people who are working in activism or in public practice or in different forms of design, like in uh, product design or technology, um, or even working in the, um, uh, yeah, addressing major global, global issues like um, refugee crisis or, uh, or working in museums. So, um, and I guess a big sort of, as Roberta has already mentioned, in the background of all of these, these practices, and it's different for everyone, of course, is this notion of crisis. And, and many of the people in our book um, sought new pathways in the um, wake of the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, which is in many ways ongoing um, and layered upon by many other crises, uh, um, climate crisis, the pandemic, not um, the least, and, and were in some ways forced or, or realised that they needed to reinvent what they do. So it's also a kind of reckoning of the last 10 years of how, um, I guess, larger forces have impacted the way people conceive of their own practices. Um, and I'm going to then pass on to Harriet to somehow uh, summarise some of the key uh, thoughts that we've, or key conclusions that we've come to in, in, the, in the book. Thank you, Rory. I think for us, you know, one of the problems we've always had with the way architecture, certainly in terms of the title architect, is incredibly rigid. And the exclusivity of the architectural community in terms of who is in and who is out really comes at our cost because what we fail to do 
by recognizing people who work on the fringes of and beyond the boundaries of architectural mainstream practice is to take credit for all of the labor that goes into the education um, and I would say preparation of, of our graduates to lead these lives of consequence far beyond our sector. And I think what the book also really revealed to us is that in fact, architecture is possibly more impactful, more effective and more relevant if it um, takes place outside of the traditions of architectural production. So architectural acts beyond buildings, whether that's curation, apps to help the homeless, um, and uh, even political systems. So this is something I think that really struck us about where architectural intelligence um, and skills are best applied, the most effectively applied. And I suppose it really comes back down to these notions of efficiencies. You know, you, there's an enormous cost for many students in doing an education. But if we continue to deny the value of that education, if it's not at all acknowledged beyond architectural qualification and its visibility as architecture with a capital A, then it, we're continuing to undervalue what is otherwise a very rigorous educational experience. So off, office image. <laughs> Next slide, sorry. <laughs> Rory, are you doing the slides? Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I guess, you know, similarly, practice, um, mainstream practice, this isn't to say that mainstream practice shouldn't exist. It just shouldn't be the only thing, right? That was our view. And we certainly made that clear in the book. Um, but we also noticed that many of um, the contributors, many of whom are here in this talk, and in fact, I hope you hear from them individually later, and there'll be some seminars at Pratt coming up in the new year if you would like to hear more from them individually because they're coming along to feature in those. But I think for us, you know, one of the things that practice became was in many ways a kind of system against which people could rebel. So we know that, as we've seen with COVID, practice is notoriously um, non-resilient. We know that it's inequitable and, dis and often discriminatory. And if and unpaid internships and maternity leave, and either, even the sheer number of women who've, who've lost their jobs um, in COVID, which are dis disproportionately higher numbers than men, male architects, um, that it really does have you know, poor um, employment prospects and security. So naturally, practice, even when it's not in a crisis, is a very good galvanizer, motivator and kind of sounding board against which many of our contributors have been able to project an alternative existence and alternative models of practice. And it really was this willingness to push beyond, um, you know, quite elitist and self-contained luxury service driven architectural activity. Not to say that all mainstream architects like that, but that's certainly one of the challenges that many of them felt they were resisting or rebelling against. Um, and I guess it really comes back to this idea of it being um, a, a unique way of thinking, something more versatile. So again, this notion that, you know, it's an epistemologically rich education, um, people are encouraged and, and actually thoroughly educated in the means of, of solving problems in three dimensions, and then taking those skills to answer other kinds of complex questions and challenges facing our society, whether that's from the visionary to the pragmatic. Um, and, and we've got examples, obviously, of Chris Hildry's work when he did um, Proxy Address, which you'll read all about in the book, a really great example of how to um, create um, addresses for uh, homeless people and so on. So um, there are obviously many ways to do architecture. And what we wanted to show was the expanded horizon of possibility for architects to show that there's so much more than private practice or even cooperative practice serving mainstream aims to show really how others have done this themselves. We had no imagining when we began this book um, long prior to COVID starting that we would see such a crisis in employment of, of young students and also recent graduates. And certainly it's acute within North American schools that now part-time practice work is no longer available, which has an enormous economic impact on students' experience and their ability to survive the costs of college, as we call it here. So I think it's very interesting to think about, um, you know, this book coming out at a time when what we hope is if the, if the architecture community cannot support its graduates, then there are other ways of taking this skill set into other employment opportunities, certainly in the interim, if not more longer term. And I think that, you know, we've got examples from Rota, which I think is this one coming up. Yep. And um, also we felt then this is something we really learned from many of the writers, that architecture really can, when it sets its mind to it, be a tool for justice and inclusion. Uh, many, of, many of the projects and certainly many of the practices featured within this book really evidence, um, I would say, what may even be described as ethical oppression um, that people have experienced prior to reaching the conclusion of, of transitioning, if you like, beyond mainstream architecture, um, that then once released from this imprisonment become really flourishes within these different contexts and different 
different ways of understanding architecture's um, ability to transform and impact upon social justice scenarios. And we've seen, we've got many people featured in the book who are have worked on questions of inclusive design, whether that's gender, disability, um, whether it concerns children or also the elderly. And I think the example here is from Joel Sanders, who identifies public restroom as a contested site of social and political struggle. Um, and of course, then we start looking um, beyond uh, the context of both North, North Europe and North America and start thinking more keenly about um, the experience um, beyond that more globally um, of what architecture can do. Um, in this particular example, we have from Robert Mull's Global Free. And I think Robert's here today, which would be great if he is. Maybe he'd answer some questions later. It's really understanding the role that our architecture or architects um, be, even be with beyond um, and even you know, on the edge of architecture um, can achieve in relation to addressing major um, societal and social challenges. Um, and again, within the book, we feature voices um, that explore um, and confront issues of climate change, the housing crisis, refugees, and so on, and having a better understanding of how architects can um, better respond and more effectively respond to these many critical issues. So for us, it's really about, you know, trying to understand what architecture is as a value proposition, just not as a, even a disciplinary construct, construct, which is interesting because disciplines, much like the institutions that can contrive them are um, as colonial as everything else that we're struggling against at the moment. So what, who's to say necessarily what comprises a discipline? or even a practice. Um, but it's very interesting to start really having an existential critique of what architecture um, is, especially when we know that by 20, 35, 80% of the jobs we will be doing haven't been invented yet. And if that's the case, why well, assume architecture will survive into the residual 15% of existing career options. Um, and if, if it is gonna survive, it needs to, I think, fight a bit harder, make itself more relevant. And certainly this book presents many ways of doing so. And finally, I mean, the question for us, what, one of the last questions that really we were confronted with was this notion of who are we responsible to? What, um, you know, architects are often schooled and certainly um, I think it's not um, unreasonable to be schooled and in how to serve the needs of client and then there'll be some, the client and then in some cases, stakeholders um, that include the end users. But I think it was really understanding that as a much more expanded field um, relative to not only the immediate end users, but also the environmental obligations that we carry that we are, have been very slow to really truthfully address. And what we really started to understand from many of the responses within the book is that we have the potential to be ethically motivated and visionary and pragmatic and to have civic values and to get things done. These are skills that society really needs today. And it was very much our hope that this book would give examples of different ways that um, students and also architects and beyond can do that. Thank you. So Roberta, I think it's back to you. <laughs> Yeah, back to me. So I just wanted to say the book is out today, like literally today. And if you go into the chat, right at the beginning of the chat, I've pasted uh, a link to a website that we have created for the book, where in the coming days we'll be posting more information about other events that might be uh, coming up in the few weeks, in the next few weeks or months. We're hoping to <laughs> have a physical presentation, a physical book launch, uh, you know, with drinks, people and the actual book at some point in 2021. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and to, to add, we are, uh, the AA Bookshop is selling the book at a special launch price. Um, and I'm just going to post the link in the chat so that people can, can avail of that. Yeah, there is a link in the chat as well that I've already posted, but if you post it again, so it's fresher, it's great. And I just wanted to end to thank Andrew for that because he negotiated a fantastic price with uh, with the publisher as well. Um, and I mean, I guess if you can put, repost your link to the website with the events, I think people who joined after you posted it can't see it, so. Yeah, sure. Can't do that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to extend to just thank everyone who's been involved in the project for sure, like the contributors, uh, again, Manisha and the Bahia Bookshop for setting this up, the publisher, and a particular thank to Studio Folder. They are here tonight, I can see Marco and Letizia and maybe they would like to say a few words about the project. They've really worked out wonders in terms of making this book not only stunning, as you can see from the few slides that we have 
shown you, but also like incredibly accessible and affordable. Can we unmute Marco? I've asked you to unmute, but I think you have to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Roberta, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I, for us, it's always a bit um, difficult to talk about a you know, graphic design project in terms of uh, why we took certain choices or the argument behind the project. Somehow, graphic design for us is a way of uh, allowing conversation between you know, all the people involved in the project. Uh, so creating, the, first of all, the conditions for this conversation to happen in the first uh, kind of concept and uh, understanding together what kind of visual shape uh, a series of uh, argument and content could uh, could take uh, and then try to articulate those uh, conversations visually. So there's not like a particular series of like uh, strong uh, uh, logical uh, steps uh, in the translating to design. Um, it's been like a very fun project to work on. Um, I have to say that, like maybe the, the design uh, stand out a series of constraints initially. Uh, the publisher said like many constraints in terms of, uh, for example, what typefaces we could use uh, or the fact that the book in black and white uh, and um, we had the possibility of choosing the paper, for example, or the binding. So that instead of conceiving the book as a kind of three-dimensional physical material object, uh, we kind of were a bit pushed on the, uh, you know, just the surface of the book. So we started to work on that. Uh, and I think the main elements uh, are these, uh, uh, we working with typography, so we chose universe as a typeface, which is a kind of super traditional uh, font, which was in the one, the one among uh, the little choice we were provided for by the, by the publisher. Uh, but also it's an amazing typeface because it allows like for so many special, let's say, with, you know, options uh, that we can play a lot with uh, with weights and um, and different uh, uh, and different just special characteristics of the different weights of the font. Uh, and then we just to create, try to create a language with that. And then uh, I think that the other main elements of the book are this kind of, uh, we have shapes uh, that uh, surface on the cover, this kind of like almost kind of wiggle, like a, uh, almost like strokes of a pen. Uh, and they were introduced both to kind of like a bit break the grid of the of the layout, but also to provide uh, an idea of like breaking also sort of a veil. No, this the architecture is, is uh, initially considered a sort of a domain or like a, a practice. We can, how we can see beyond it. Uh, and also kind of remind the idea of, of the sketch, you know, as a way of like constantly prototyping new ideas of practices. So kind of like very, let's say, simple uh, visual cues of what the contents of the book are. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say more than this. Just has been like a very a pleasure to work with, with the editors and, and also Thank other contributors. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Um, it was such it was so great to work with you, and and of course I was. You're also in the book because you're, um, in a way, one of our case studies as somebody who studied architecture and then who has moved into communication, graphic design, visual design. I, 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 perhaps we could ask you, and to the other contributors who are here certainly as well, you know, what's your relationship to architecture now? How do you define yourself in relation to your studies, for instance? Uh, yeah, maybe I can I can reply shortly and then leave the yeah. space for the others to. Uh, yeah, so I mean I I operate a studio folder, so like a kind of a large not just me but like a larger group of, of people. Um, let's say for me, so the background of the different people is kind of diverse. So we're a studio that is truly like multidisciplinary in this sense, um, between like coders, designers, and, and architects. Um, Say for me, since even before starting study architecture, it, it never I never saw architecture as a as a built environment. Not say just limited to the built environment. So architecture is building. For me, it's always been interesting as a way to um, think ways to organize knowledge and culture. 
uh, of course, with a strong accent to the visual. So for me, I always try to apply the tools of architecture in the way in which we can structure information. I think also this kind of reflect a lot in our practice in which we really span between different scales uh, in which we treat uh, information as a almost kind of a multidimensional material in which we, with which we can work. So this kind of information can apply to the digital realm, to the physical space in the forms of uh, you know, three-dimensional installations, exhibitions, and uh, uh, also to the space of like visual and digital projects. Um, and then of course, I think the role of the, I mean, from architecture also as, as, as a big uh, social and civic responsibility. I think we are practitioners that are all like trained in uh, you know, changing space, so changing what is like the commons. So I think this kind of attitude and, and attention and responsibility as something that really comes with, the, with our education, I think is really fundamental. Thanks, Marco. Um, I know it's, it's difficult because of the um, muting scenario with the Zoom, but um, I've noticed we've got a, a half a dozen of the other contributors here, Roger Zagolovich, Shireen El Nashi, Alex Schroeder, Scott Patterson, um, Takeshi Hiatsu, Chris Hildry, Mulkik, Shoshan. Um, so if anyone is there, I don't know if you can use that wave function or something to alert your presence to our um, helpful Raise your hand. AA people <laughs> in the chat, perhaps. Yeah. And then we, it'd be great if you could also reflect on your own practice in relation to, to architecture. Um, and yeah, if that if doesn't your, work, we can. If you have your video on, you can just wave at me, or um, in the participants tab, you can click raise hand and I'll unmute you. Good plan. Thank you. So we'll, we'll wait a minute to see if anyone comes out of the woodwork. We we could answer the question in the chat, Rory. Um, do we imagine a sequel? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. right? We have... <laughs> do, you, do you want to swing it back, Harriet? <laughs> Publisher oh, extraordinary. Gosh. Well, insofar as we, yeah, it was odd. Once we had completed the book, we did get quite a few people, including an admiral of an, of an African navy. Um, who was a woman who trained as an architect and was now bossing blokes around in uniforms on massive boats intended for destruction, who wanted to be featured in the book. So we felt rather amiss that we weren't able to include her. Um, but yeah, I think because we've had so many people reach out to us, we wouldn't rule it out. So certainly if any of you fall into our category and you get in touch, I think it's a, a very good question. And I wonder also, you know, if we do go into a sort of sequel, if that's the word, um, a couple of year or two from now, it might be interesting to see what then shifts as we come out of um, COVID confinement and how that changes um, the nature of the profession and also what opportunities exist and no longer exist. And being able to capture that in the process of a sequel would be good, I think. Absolutely. I can see a couple- And Kimberly's uh, here too. Uh, Fantastic. I can see Roger and Scott and Mulkeet with their cameras on. If yes. anyone if you would be keen to reply, give us a, a vigorous way. Or oh, Robert Mull, he said to Perhaps we can <laughs> unmute somebody. Manager. I defer to Roger. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a Roger. Okay, thanks, Scott. Roger, Roger, you're unmuted. Yeah, uh, I, I have. Thank you very much. I feel kind of uh, very honoured to be uh, part of this extraordinary um, scope. Uh, and I, I suppose the word that I think comes to my mind is one of bravery. There's always a, a um, there's something about taking charge of yourself and utilising these kind of skills that we have as architects to imagine a future that is a kind that is uh, that is something which is which is uh, different to a straightforward artistic because as architects we have a kind of pragmatism we have to have a need we have to have a challenge and we find that so easily so there's a kind of there's a wonderful um, both enthusiasm positive way but also a bravery. And I think that what you've done in this book is encapsulated such diversity that it actually demonstrates that. And I suppose that in this very confusing world that we now inhabit, with very difficult, uh, almost impossible pathways, 
into a future, we see the challenges and we have to kind of imagine those futures. And that really becomes um, something that's amazingly exciting. I mean, obviously it's kind of nerve, nervous, but it's in a way it's kind of, it's so interesting, the challenges of, of, uh, of, of global warming, the challenges of work. I mean, this notion that we're actually going to be working independently, nomadically, but then our need for social interchange becomes, means that the city itself, I'm not, I'm an urbanist, but here am I sitting on the coast looking across at the sea, it's dark at the moment. But, but all of these things are becoming, you know, that my, my, my age is such that I'm rooted and my, my architecture was based around the analog and still is the, the notion of drawing and sketching and hand movement. And I now inhabit an entirely digital world becomes more digital and I long for the analog and I, and I still engage with it. And I think in any conversation with I, I want the analog, I want to hold on to the analog. And I think that, and I believe that mark making is so fundamental to uh, our human condition that I think it becomes a wonderful challenge for us in the digital age of how we make the physical. And so I think this, these, if you like, all of the, all of these um, contributors to this book have in a way kind of uh, pioneered in their own way, their own sort of independent vision. And that independence and that bravery, I think makes this a, an extraordinary collection. And I congratulate you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Very generous of you. Um, and uh, I can see Scott and uh, Mulkeet. Oh, Mulkeet's unmuted. Perhaps, um, Mulkeet, if you could uh, reflect on your own um, practice, particularly in your work with the United Nations and in these um, uh, distributed, difficult territories that you operate in. Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations. Hi, everyone. Um, it's hard to reflect at this moment I'm after one re like after a sequence of reviews uh, but there is always something to say my departure from architecture was in a way an existential thing and like it's a mental survival you know I was I, I, I was born and I was raised in a nation state that was incredibly exclusive uh, that made and it made me and through architecture I also saw the power of actually how, the design of the built environment is so incredibly instrumental in shaping uh, huge political forces. And I didn't want to take part in it. And I started to figure out, you know, through another struggle, what is the way to actually, what is a good way for me to engage with architecture and address issues of rights and um, uh, look into ways through which we can actually open up and use some of the capacities and power of architecture to extrapolate through scale and understand, understanding ab abstract systems and institutions and policies and to penetrate this through questions and through words and through advocacy and activism. Um, and I think that can be actually quite powerful. And at least for me, it excites me and fill my time. And uh, there is so much work to be done. And yeah, and I think this, uh, your attempt to open up and show all this struggle on the margin to rethink how we can uh, empower ourselves, empower our imagination and kind of fight all these uh, hegemonies because it's all, much of it is about uh, creating tools to kind of fight back power or claim back power or dismantle power. So I think it's uh, it's great. And I hope our students will read it. I will for sure recommend it to my students. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. And we might um, jump to Scott Patterson, uh, please, if, he, if we can manage the muting. Yeah, I, I'm glad I waited because I want to just build on what Roger and Malik, Malik just said, because I think I feel still very connected to the discipline. I personally consider myself kind of post-discipline. I apply whatever discipline or bring it to me depending on the problem. And 
I think the training allows you to do everything from a, a bit what Roger was saying, like the analytic, like what are the features and then our ability to express it either in analog or digital form. But the profession, as you guys framed it at the beginning, has its limits in terms of what the discipline suggests you can address. And so when you start to ask, uh, who are the decision makers? Who has the power that's upstream of where I am? And how can I gain access to them? And what can I um, contribute? Or how can I participate in that to, with design to bring about some other future? Um, that's what I've done over since I like the last 20 plus years of figuring out like what discipline do I need to either have myself or bring to the table to persuade a politician or a CEO to do something differently. And a lot of that's through the portrayal of alternative futures than what they currently see. And architects have been doing that forever. Uh, but just not in a, it's kind of for themselves, less in a consultative, consultative way. Um, so I think the book is, I, I mean, if I had seen this as a student, I'm curious, like I would have started on the path earlier. So knowing that all these folks are out there, uh, myself included, um, I hope is uh, an amazing resource for people to reach out to us. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Scott. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and exactly that's our, our hope is the sort of, um, guidebook or a menu of possibilities for people who are entering architecture, but who may not see themselves um, strictly within the within the conventional frame that's offered to them. Um, and perhaps finally, from the contributors, I can see um, Shireen El Nashi has her um, hand up also, and then we then we can open up to the um, audience for either perhaps to share their own experiences of of after architecture or to ask questions of us or of any of the contributors. Um, Perhaps we can unmute Shireen, please. Hi, everyone. I'm not sure you can see me from here. I'm coming yes. from, from Lesbos. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, first, thanks so much for the invitation to be involved. When you guys reached out the other week or, or last year even, I had no idea who else would be invited. So it's, it's a huge honor to discover all of these other amazing names. Um, I think in terms of like my relation to to the training of architecture and the and the profession, the the sort of two the two things that are always in tension here, uh, working in the sort of humanitarian context with refugees, is around the process and about the aesthetics. Um, and on the one hand, you kind of have to let go of this typical design aesthetic that you're you're kind of trained in within architecture um, to kind of let go of that preciousness. But at the same time recognizing the power that that aesthetic can have. So actually trying to apply some of those design aesthetic um, sensibilities to a lot of the way that you're presenting the work of refugees to challenge this notion that so many people have of how things look. You know, the amount of times we have an exhibition and someone comes in and says, wow, a refugee made that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a really interesting play between, between those, those aspects here. And I guess in terms of Again, how the, the training helps, like it's so wonderful that this book is coming out now because I felt so frustrated when I was studying at trying to fi yeah, find these alternatives and find the kind of the things on the fringes, how you could interplay, but all of the processes that you're going to, that, that kind of rigorous thinking, um, the kind of elasticity that you need your mind to play between the, the big scale and the details, I think has helped a lot with a lot of the, the strategies for designing programs, um, different interactions and, and many different aspects. So it's, it's definitely useful. And I think it's wonderful that architecture can start really looking beyond the, the tradition of, of what we expect practice to be like. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, um, Harris and Roberta, do you, do you have any strong feelings about how we ought to open up, but or um, shall we just ex um, take some questions or um, propositions? Um, is it dangerous to unleash the masses into the microphone universe? Of, <laughs> I just wonder if that's. I think that'd be fine. No, I think, I think people ready for criticisms. Yeah. 
But I think we can open to the floor, as it were, the virtual giant floor. Yeah. Okay, so we're has along. A, There's a really good oh, comment in the chat. Question in the chat, right? Oh, it's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really long. I'm just getting. <laughs> you want to read it, Carolina? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carolina, <laughs> come and speak to us. It's a really good point. It's going to take me a good ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's not a question. It's more of a, a very important insight that everyone should read. Maggie's got a question about the ARB, RBA. Yeah, yeah this, yeah, this conversation about qualification, yeah. I think this is a really good question. I mean, already in the US, um, we have a different qualification right, system and even, oh, sorry. I'll just repeat the question. question before you respond to it. Um, do you think yeah. professional bodies like the ARB, RBA should offer more routes to qualification in order to acknowledge people practicing in the fringes of architecture? Um, I just want to check, Shireen, did you want to answer that? You had your hand up. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I guess, well, okay, so in the US we have an EAB, um, but it's not all states because, let's face it, there's 50 states and they don't all agree on a lot of things. Um, and so that's one thing, and there isn't really, at the moment, a mobility agreement between, between ARB and ROBA. So I suppose I'm sort of a bit more preoccupied with questions of the value of accreditation than maybe other people are at the moment. Um, I think it's also about just title, like what constitutes an architect. So in the US, it's title and function. In the UK, only title is protected. But I think, again, what comes under the title of architect is really limited as well. And I think that's where we end up with a system that forces people to define what they do and to limit what they do to a certain series of acts. And I think that's where we're missing an opportunity to recognize the diversity of applications of architectural intelligence. So we're kind of undervaluing ourselves. We always talk about architectural value and we get terribly preoccupied about how little we get paid and naturally with salaries and fees diminishing year on year, decade on decade since we all left you know, local authority practice offices. Um, it's unsurprising this is an endless preoccupation. But I do think that it really does come down to kind of the fact that we've been so preoccupied with, you know, battling away on our territories, like one of those, you know, severed limb knights out of Monty Python episode, um, that we haven't really thought more keenly about the potential incursions we might make into other sectors and, and, other, and other ways of doing things. And I think that's the problem. So this title becomes, um, with it, the baggage that is an accreditation and the recognition system, um, I think a debilitator, unless we start having, unless the RIBA even, and given that it's got this big windfall, you know, ching, let's go and have some meaningful conversations about the planet and paying people and scholarships, etc. But that's where it has an opportunity right now to really expand its definition, in my view. Oh, we've got other questions. Yeah, and perhaps I can just add to that. I mean, one of the things we've talked about lately is, um, you know, Foster and Zaha Hadid architects withdrawing from architects declare. And, yeah. you know, it, it may not be meaningful on the scale of the planet, but for us, it shows the sort of inability actually of the capital A architecture to address those larger questions. You know, it, given the choice between completely transforming what they do or business as usual, they chose business as usual because it's it, they're, they're so entangled in these um, structures which keep them on that path. Um, and so we actually need to reimagine new paths. Um, and I think that that's re really what we're trying to do. And that's where this connection to crisis or to um, the grand challenges is so important for us. And, and the work of, for instance, many of the people here of Shireen working with refugees and Lesbos, um, Mulkeet working um, in, with, with the United Nations peacekeeping, it, it shows what happens when you can um, find a new mode to operate in. Um, we've got a question from Sylvie, Sylvie's iPhone. Uh, what are the best <laughs> non architectural practices created by architects? Um, well, I, would, I wouldn't be so brave as to rank them best to worst, but we've got plenty of examples in the book. Um, Roberta, would you like to throw a few forward at some concrete examples of, of the people that we're presenting? Um, sure. I mean, 
let's get and even the ones from our presentation maybe which we didn't necessarily spend too much time on yes um i mean and, and by that you mean people who still practice within architecture i'm assuming oh. So, I think no, no, the question is non-architectural practices created by architects. Um, I mean, I would think that, you know, a practice like Rotor or um, the work of, of Robert or of any of them that we presented in the, a moment ago. Yeah. Um, or Chris Hildry. We won't get too obsessed with the term non-architect. <laughs> we could we get we could get terribly cross, couldn't we? But we might not now. <laughs> I mean, but well, perhaps to give one example, I'll just throw this up again, which is a project that um, created by Chris Hildry in in London, who trained as an architect, but has then rethought his, um, I, I guess relationship to problem solving and he has created a project which has launched only a month ago or so called proxy address which um, registers or, or rather provides an address for homeless people for them to use in order that they may participate in uh, formal services such as the welfare system or um, benefits or um, yeah, just to be able to register and participate in those um, systems of care, which they may not otherwise be eligible to as somebody without an address. Oh, Chris, Chris, I've done a terrible job of describing your project and you're here. Um, let's, <laughs> Chris, uh, yeah, would you like to describe your project? <laughs> uh, hello, I'm not sure if you can uh, see me or anything. Yes, uh, you're on, you're good. Okay. Oh, perfect. Uh, hello. Uh, no, 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 I, I'm not stepping in by any means. Don't worry, I just thought I'd, I'd better chip in. Um, yeah, no, I think, well, I was, I was originally going to comment on the, on the, the non-architect issue, uh, which is to say that, um, I mean, I called my studio Hildry Studio quite deliberately uh, to not be called Hildry Architects, um, purely because I didn't want people to come to me only for buildings, which tends to be the perception of what an architect does. And that, that really sort of feeds into to the proxy address work as well, because I think with proxy address, that came about because of my architectural training, but it was strangely the the kind of poison chalice of architectural education in a sense, which is that you're trained to to see and and to spot all the, the problems that might be happening in the built environment, but you don't generally have the remit to necessarily do anything about it. Um, I think there's a phrase I, I think I used in the essay in the book, which is that as an architect, people don't come to you to ask you what should be built, they come to you to ask you to design what's going to be built. So you're already quite far downstream at that point. And, and from my point of view, you know, with, with my career having a backdrop in the UK of austerity, and I can see libraries closing, public land being sold off, um, you know, public toilets closing, homelessness rocketing up. That's a built environment issue. And I think anybody who goes into architecture before they really know what it is, because, you know, you're not taught about it um, in school that very much. Um, you go in because generally speaking, you have this vague notion that you want to make the world a slightly more livable place. You know, you want to make it more pleasant for people. And I think by the time I was practicing, I was realizing that actually I had been trained in all these different ways through our education. And then I was having all those skills focused through the lens of practice into, into one particular output, which is that it is buildings or nothing. And from my point of view, I, I just don't see why we should be doing that. It seems a bit of a waste to me that if you have, uh, if you come out of the education system with a skill in whether it's, you know, art, graphic design, vague placemaking, or even things like project management or, you know, technology, why not use those skills in a way that you can improve the city that might not just happen to be a building? So um, from my point of view as well, this is very much stemmed from something that Harriet mentioned earlier, which is that I did a two year research degree into unpaid overtime in architecture, um, which always went down well in job interviews, as you can imagine. And uh, I, I came to the conclusion from that, that, you know, architecture essentially just, you know, really needs to diversify. Um, that's, or, well, the way I see architecture um, for myself being practiced is that it should diversify, that we should use our skills 
uh, not in a focused way, but in a, in any way that is applicable. And if we find problems that require new solutions that aren't buildings, then we should be able to adapt ourselves and uh, apply ourselves in the ways that are most, you know, most suited to the problem, not to our own given solution. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I think what you've said certainly sums up our feelings around the limitations of, of, of only buildings and the um, vast opportunities for applying our thinking in other forms. Um, crucially, I would say, um, you know, the, the unique capability of architects of specialising issues, like putting issues in the form of space, and also extrapolating issues from space, analysing it, which is something that has come up in a lot of the essays, like Finn Williams, for instance, talks about it, and a number of other practitioners like Andre Schaak um, discusses it as well, which is, again, this unique capability of understanding space and um, translating it for other people, because like, we're all in it. It's not that easy to read space somehow. And sometimes like we just, um, you know, we're, we're taken by it rather than being able to act. So enabling people to act in space is what a lot of people in this book do and, and enable people to understand space and to be able to have their own say about the built environment and what is around them. And up. That's Scott. <laughs> I'm just going to say, like, I mean, like this session now, I run into architects all the time who are, you know, we're like, hey, good to see you here, because we're part of a different conversation, right? So, and we comment on this, like, what's going on with the profession that they have not figured out how to get more upstream to better their circumstances? A lot of other industries, professions are figuring that out to continue to make themselves relevant. And I think this issue of accreditation, et cetera, is like, how do you stay relevant in a changing world? And yes, I mean, there's still this incredibly important role of designing an amazing building, et cetera. Like that can't go away either. That still has to, but having some clarity about that's just going to continue to get eroded if the values or relevance to society of that goes away. So some amount of people need to figure out how to go upstream. And if these institutions aren't savvy to that or the best at that, which as far as I can tell are not, then, you know, your book, it has to be one of the sort of voices in the crowd showing that there are these other pathways to do that so that people know, because the minute you leave the profession, some of the income stuff goes away. Like that you, that you, you call it fringe, but I'm like, I'm out of it. And now it's like, I'm not fringe, like, right? So it's like a very relativistic perspective to call this group of people fringe. Like I'm, I run into Shireen's more than anybody else, right? And I'm like, hey, you're out here doing this thing, having this huge impact. And you kind of woke up in a way to like what influence is possible. And I, I think to this comment, like the way schools are designed that it's upside down in my mind, it's like, or inverted. It's like, what problems do you want to work on in the world and figure out, help people figure that out. And then, all right, here are some disciplines you can pick up to do that as a start, not the other way around. Yeah, that's very nice, actually. Thank you, Scott. Um, there's one question in the chat, um, which is from Robert Martin, directed at me. Have you found a large difference slash progression slash expansion in the types of jobs you surveyed in your 2012 book, Future Practice, to those in architects after architecture? If so, what were they? And in a way, it, it, it picks up on, Scott, your, your, the point you've just made, which is that, you know, I don't recognise being fringe. I think when, when I was looking at this um, in 2011, the, it was a, these practices were emerging in a, in a kind of um, reaction, knee-jerk reaction to the, to the context. And they were very provisional, um, they were very um, marginal, and they were quite proudly marginal, actually. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is a, is a further legitimization of these other 
modes of practice that, um, you know, these are not people who are operating out of a kind of reactive desperation, but who are intentionally setting out to make different impacts and set up a different relationship to the world through the way that they practice. And, and by practice, it's both, I think of the word practice meaning both how I set myself up as a business, as an organization, as you know, within my own terms, but most critically, how does that, the way that I've set myself up, allow me to influence the world or allow me, what are the levers then at my disposal to make change? And if we understand that, you know, building a building or working for a client is one particular lever, what are the other levers? What's that broader horizon of possibility? So that's, and, and I think certainly to answer the question, as I say, it's that legitimacy of those other levers, those other modes. Thank you. May, can I add to this, if I may? I mean, Roger, I, please, yeah. yeah. I think it, to me, it was a, it was a value judgment. What I couldn't understand when I started off in architecture, and actually when I qualified, I never, I have in my career, I I actually have only worked for another uh, firm for three days, uh, and that was to undertake some designs for a barber shop in a prison. And I, I found it a sort of not really well. It's an it's a memory, but uh, uh, it was a, a long time ago. Uh, but I think that the re absolutely seemed to me the kind of insanity of uh, of our profession was the failure for us to give ourselves the value that we deserved. That somehow uh, our, our professional body did not recognize or could not find a, recognize, a way of recognizing how we were able to validate that value. Now that, that doesn't apply if you're, if I then moved into development, which is a different world to lots of you, but that then gave me my own ability to be my client, beyond my own ability to set my projects, set the programs, my ability to collaborate with uh, lots of architects in, in a way making something creative, but at the same time, ultimately tying myself to the value, tying my enterprise to that value. And I, and I, don't, I think that that's a kind of, that has to be a pursuit of excellence that is that there is the only way of doing it. I don't think it's anything about validation. It is just literally ensuring that the, the creativity that we bring to it is, is, is a recognition of value. And whether we do that through patents, whether we do it through ownership, whether we do it through motivation, whether we do it through uh, political action, it, it's an individual activity. And I think what's so interesting and intriguing about the book is the way all of the people who have come and shared their experience is an experience of their own. It has their own gene, it has their own take. And in a way, what, what all I was able to do was to kind of decide how I could, what area I functioned in, and I, I brought with me the integrity that I learned from architecture and brought it into another field, in my case, development. Fantastic. Thank you, Roger. Um, there's lots of questions popping up in the chat. And um, thank you to everyone for, for making those contributions. And one of the things, I was just skimming, because I'm trying to, <laughs> of course, listen to the discussion as well as read. There's a, there's a, there seems to be a, a discussion around money or around, you know, how you pay the bills with these different forms of practice. So um, I'm not sure if, if um, Roberta or Harriet or anyone would like to um, pick up on that thread. You know, what, what does it mean when you leave the conventional practice? How do you um, pay the bills? Roberta? I think in the book, we one of the takeaways was that surely the financial viability of the profession was one of the things, one of the issues which made a lot of people leave, uh, particularly like with the financial crisis of 2008, like a lot of people like had to reinvent the way they worked and, um, and they found other paths. Um, but also like one thing that I would like to say is that some of the, and, and, and you know, some of the contributors are also like very candid and very open about how that was one of their motivation for leaving. Um, but I think crucially is like not necessarily like taking alternative paths means that um, 
you know, you're setting yourself up for a life of um, starvation or like you go down different types of, uh, you know, you, you, you're less rewarded if you follow the conventional path of accreditation. Like, for instance, I think all the people who, most of the people who work within tech uh, in the book, like that certainly like part of the motivation for making the jump was a better prospect and a better salary to some extent. So um, just wanted to, I like that. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd I, just to add to that, I, when I, I started my practice while I was still doing my part two um, with Susie Wynn Stanley, Design Heroine, and we were entirely process over product driven, all, fem, all female feminist architecture practice, Design Heroine, um, and as fringe. And we won a business plan competition. So that's um, obviously a privilege and not available to everyone, right? So I think this question of money is a really interesting one to me as a dean. Because I think that traditionally at many schools saw, I would say, their obligations to students as just being qualifications um, that were obviously handed down by um, prescriptive accreditation um, and naturally, you know, a national standards such as, um, you know, the QAA. But I think that now I think a lot of schools, and I'm not alone, are looking at making sure that somewhere in the curriculum, uh, uh, some understanding of, of entrepreneurship, innovation, how do you make things work? What are, what's the financial dimensions to not just going graduating full of talent ideas and then basically doing the equivalent of cleaning the toilets in an architectural practice detailing car parks for three years to get your part three but actually being able to graduate um, and hit the employment market as a, as a potential employer rather than employee and so that's been something I've been really preoccupied with and I think it does mean a curricular shift trying to do that outside in a way the mandate of ROBA or NEAB is harder because we don't have spare cash as you can imagine especially now with COVID to indulge in non-compulsive and non-core electives around entrepreneurship and innovation, we're trying. But if it's not mandatory, it's a horse to water situation. But I do think that, you know, it, yes, people come to education with all very, very different kinds of advantage and they leave education with very different kinds of advantage. If you've not read Paying for the Party, I'll put the link in the chat in a moment. That's a phenomenal book that completely captures how two women entering US higher education, one from wealth, one from the other into equal level Ivy League schools, the one who came from poverty was still paying off debt decades after she graduated and never reached the same level of financial success, even after graduation and even with an identical qualification. So yes, I think you're right that class and the finance dimension of this and economics of this is a huge, I wouldn't say it's an elephant in the room. It just is one of the most overwhelming problems that influences all aspects of, of any career advancement and, and professional progress. That it's, you know, it's a structural and, and, and a ubiquitous problem rather than an architecture specific one. But I think it's right to challenge us if we do continue with a sequel to make this a conversation that we prioritize in in the next iteration absolutely thank you harriet um we've got chris with his hand up so perhaps he could join and just to say we'll probably um take one or two or one more question and we'll finish at 40 past the hour in five minutes or so um and there was another discussion here, which I, which might be good to finish with after we've heard from Chris around um, Celeste's point. I think my perspective is that maybe they don't have to leave. So the, the sense that this is an anti-architecture discussion might be a good place to finish. But first, um, Chris. Uh, yeah, I was just I was just really going to respond to some some of the points that were mentioned. There. I, th I think the 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 arguments around finance um, and economy around architecture are so crucial because um, it's such a bizarre profession. Um, I mean, through my university, I had friends who weren't architects and they were made my friends after university, obviously me graduating a lot later than them. And um, they it was so hard to, to explain to them the, the way that architecture works because from their point of view, there is a default position that the more you study, the better you do at university, the, the better job you get, therefore, the more money you get paid. Whereas in architecture, what I've found is the better you do, the better job you might get and the more reputable practices and the less you get paid, generally speaking. Uh, I think if anybody is concerned about architecture, uh, so um, salary in architecture, they will be pushed generally towards the less exciting uh, capital A architectural practices. And I think that's a really bizarre one. And for me, it comes back to, uh, again, something that I looked at in this unpaid overtime research, which is that 
um, and something that, that Roger mentioned earlier, which is about communicating the value of architecture um, and how do we do that. And I think what part of the problem is that, you know, it was mentioned earlier about the, the importance of clients and end users, but, you know, private residential aside, most of the time in architecture, the end users are not the client. The, the client is, a, is almost an in-between. And I think if, if we're honest with ourselves as architects, as architects, most of the time, the design decisions that we're getting in are almost shoehorned in surreptitiously to the benefit of the end user, almost past the client, so it doesn't get value engineered down in the meantime. And so I think it's very difficult a lot of times to, um, to try and communicate this kind of, um, the, the qualitative value that we bring. Because the quantitative side of what we do as architects is, is, you know, is easily taken away from us. Uh, our USP as architects is the qualitative side of things. And we can't put a quantity on that. We can't communicate that to a market who values, who, well, whose judgment of value is based on quantitative uh, methods. So I think there's a real almost kind of cultural shift that would have to happen to get the wider kind of culture to understand the importance of imbuing the built relationship, uh, the built environment with design ch choices that are made in the interests of the end user. But that's a, it's almost a, a cultural societal shift. And, and for me, that's why I focused on, on diversification rather than trying to turn the tide of the river, because I, I don't know how that, that, how that can be coordinated beyond simply being you know, hoped for. But I think it's a really interesting conversation that definitely needs to happen is, is how do we actually communicate the value that we bring. Thank you, Chris. Um, we might uh, wind up very shortly, perhaps just very quickly to respond to one last question. And thanks to everybody for their brilliant comments in the chat. That It's worth having a um, read through because there's incredible intelligence there. Um, question from Celeste. I think my perspective is that maybe they don't have to leave per se. And I think this is super important, the sense that we are um, attacking the conventional version of architecture and, and with, its, with the means for destruction. And I, and I would certainly say that that's not the case, that not everybody ought to leave. Um, we, are, we need to maintain the, the strength and integrity of conventional practice and you know, all of the comments notwithstanding to increase its value, to increase its relevance, to increase its um, agency. And I think what we're saying is rather than attacking that space to expand the space around it and to say that's not the only tool of agency and there are other tools and let's just be aware of them. Let's just be. Um, let's just recognise them, and to um, introduce the possibility that there are other ways that we can um, make agency. So that's the. Uh, I, I would say that's our response to um, the sense that we're encouraging people to leave. That's certainly not the case, but but simply looking for other tools that we can we can share. Um, to finish off, we could. Um, Promote the book, please buy the book. <laughs> There's links in the chat, perhaps we can paste it again to the AA Bookshop who are doing a um, brilliant deal. Um, and also to thank everybody who's contributed um, this evening, especially to all of the contributors who we've put on the spot um, uh, tonight <laughs> and who have bravely put their hands up to, to, to um, add to our discussion. It's been, we're, we're super grateful for all of you for, for your contributions, both to the book and to tonight. And to um, if you follow Pratt School of Architecture on Instagram or uh, if you're subscribed to our newsletter, which you can do through Instagram, um, you'll see that we have four talks about the book this year or next academic year um, around different themes. So grouping different types of contributors together, um, many of whom are here this evening, but haven't really had at all a fair chance to represent their work. <laughs> so hear more in-depth discussions with them and also um, co-editors. Um, in the new year. So please follow us to find out more about those events. Those events are also free and open to the public. And, we'll, and we're all putting them at roughly this time, actually middle of the, U, um, the U, US day in the evening for, for um, UK um, people who want to join. So it's fairly accessible time, I hope. And definitely also just to close um, to the question of how this could take new forms or if there is a sequel to that, like we've, we've been thinking about that and we, we may very much see this as a start of a broader conversation to broaden the boundaries of the profession. So we can think about a format for that too.